Hi, my name is Dr. Bond Blossman, and I will be covering glycolysis with you. There are 10 steps of glycolysis. It is going to be occurring in the cytosol of the cell. All of the enzymes for glycolysis are in the cytosol, and as glucose comes into the cell, that is where it will participate in its own breakdown. So let's just get right into it and go over the steps one by one. Again, there's 10 steps and they all occur in the cell. So here we have step one. Our uh, glucose has entered the cell and once it does, it gets a ball and chain put on it. And this ball and chain is known as a phosphate ion. We're going to break it off of ATP adenosine triphosphate. This is our energy currency for the cell. And by doing so, this is a phosphorylation reaction. We stick it on the sixth carbon. If you look at how to uh, number these carbons, we're gonna call carbon number one, which used to be, say, an aldehyde, in this case of an aldose sugar. This is carbon number one, which is our anomeric carbon. And we go from here, one, two, three, four, five, six. This is carbon number six. And the phosphate group is going to be attached there. All right, uh, this enzyme is regulated. It is not the most regulated, but is step one is typically going to be regulated. And it is going to it is going to be controlled by end product inhibition. So the amount of glucose 6-phosphate will be feeding back upon this enzyme. Again, I'll talk about regulation in a minute. But magnesium is going to be a cofactor. Magnesium, being a positive molecule, is going to help constrain that negative ATP molecule in place in the active site. And this enzyme is pretty cool, this hexokinase because it definitely follows the induced fit model because it's, it's almost like a Pac-Man. And when the substrates bind, then it's going to close and catalyze that reaction. Um, so it's gonna hold the ATP in place with the magnesium, then the substrate glucose comes in and it gets catalyzed. Okay, so that's step one. It did require an ATP to react but it is an overall coupled reaction. It is exergonic overall. If you were to split this up into two reactions, ATP yields ADP plus PI, that would be exergonic, a negative 30.5 kilojoules would be released. And then uh, the endergonic portion of this would be glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. But if you add them, if you add these coupled reactions, and as long as they're overall exergonic, then we can assume that they are spontaneous. Okay, so again, the reaction is endergonic, this one, uh, putting the actual phosphate on the ATP. It will be driven fr from the actual hydrolysis of ATP to ADP plus PI, which is exergonic. So um, just to be clear, if you add these two coupled reactions together, then overall the reaction will be exergonic. Step two, we have the glucose 6-phosphate, which is like the ball and chain. It's not gonna leave the cell, but it's not committed to glycolysis yet. Um, the second step is gonna be an isomerization from an aldose to a ketose. So we're gonna go from a glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate, which is a ketose sugar. At this point, of course, we haven't lost any carbons. We retain all of our carbons, so there's no decarboxylation reactions in glycolysis, but we will have an oxidation later. This is just a prep step uh, for what is to come. So here, the C1 aldehyde of glucose 6-phosphate is going to be reduced to a hydroxyl group, so here. So this is where it was, and this is where it is now. So that would be C1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And so we still have a phosphate on C6. But again, we go from an aldose to a ketose sugar. 
This reaction is catalyzed by glucose phosphate isomerase, and this step is not regulated. So the C2-hydroxyl, which is here, is going to be oxidized to give the ketone group of fructose 6-phosphate, which is here. So just following the molecules, uh, we take this hydroxyl and here's the oxygen, and again, this is our C1 that used to be the aldehyde group. So no net redox in this uh, stage or uh, reaction. All right, the next reaction is uh, considered to be step three, and this is going to be a a very important regulated step. It is regulate or it is catalyzed by phosphofructokinase, otherwise known as PFK. Technically, it's PFK1. Uh, we'll see PFK2 in the regulatory um, end of things. We start with fructose 6-phosphate again, which was a keto sugar. We're only going to be adding another phosphate. Uh oh. Here we have an ATP, so it's going to cost us again. We are in the investment phase where we're setting up for the payoff phase. So we have, we have now put in two molecules of ATP that uh, we'll later make back. So here we can see what's happening. This hydroxyl group is going to be replaced with phosphate and where do we get the phosphate? We got it from ATP. Phosphofructokinase has magnesium as a cofactor. Again, we're dealing with ATP. So ATP is largely negative. It has three phosphate groups that are all negatively charged, especially that third phosphate group is unstable because it's got so much negativity around it. Uh, we have electrostatic repulsion there. But this is a, an allosteric enzyme that is going to be controlled by not only allosteric effectors, it's also going to be controlled via covalent modification. I'll go through that. All right, so fructose 6-phosphate is then phosphorylated again to generate fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. This is a very important intermediate. We call this the key intermediate. This can undergo feed-forward activation on step 10. That's catalyzed by pyruvate kinase. And the reason why it does that is because the next step, catalyzed by aldolase, which is a cleavage, is going to be an endergonic uh, reaction. So we need something to be pulling the metabolic pathway forward. And if we activate a future step, then we can accomplish that. So fructose 1,6-bisphosphate would be the key intermediate of glycolysis. PFK is going to be the key enzyme, uh, the most highly regulated enzyme. This is also a committal step. This is where the um, fructose 6-phosphate is marrying glycolysis. Once it enters, it is going to be presumed to go all the way to the end. So there's, there's no other pathway that fructose 6-phosphate can jump to. This is the second reaction to be coupled to ATP's hydrolysis. So again, it is going to be an intergonic reaction to put the phosphate on. It's a synthesis reaction. You're putting two things together. So that's going to be intergonic. But because we're hydrolyzing the phosphate, the terminal anhydride bond on the phosphate of the ATP to ADP, that is releasing energy. And if you add them up, it is still going to be an extragonic overall coupled reaction. Phosphofructokinase is going to be the key regulatory enzyme. This is the rate limiting step of this metabolic pathway, and it gives the key intermediate, which is fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, which can also act as a feed-forward activator on step 10. So PFK is a tetramer, so it's an allosteric enzyme. It is subject to allosteric feedback as well as covalent control. We have this tetramer has L and M subunits. The L is going to be for liver, the M is going to be for muscle. So in the liver cells you would see an L4. In muscle cells you would see an M4. 
and say in the blood you might see any kind of combination, you know, maybe L2, M2, etc. Um, all of the combinations exist and we're going to call those isozymes. Okay, again, muscles are going to be very rich in the M4s and liver will be rich in the L4s. ATP is going to be an allosteric effector. Whenever you think about a cell that has plenty of energy and doesn't need to be uh, breaking down any more glucose, then think about this scenario. It will have a lot of ATP and it will have a lot of reduced NADs. So it will have a lot of NADHs. In that case, we don't need to break down more energy. We don't need to break down more glucose to create more energy. So it would make sense that ATP would be an allosteric effector of PFK. But then if you think about it, well, you might say it's also a substrate because it is participating in this reaction. If I go back, here's the reaction. ATP is going to be a substrate and it will be fitting into the active site, but it will also be fitting into the allosteric site as an inhibitor. So only when the concentration of ATP is high enough is this going to be um, actually inhibiting the reaction. Remember, it's going to be relying upon diffusion. So if you have a lot of ATPs, the chances of more and more ATPs diffusing into the allosteric site are increased. Another thing I must note is that in the allosteric site it has a lower affinity which means it has a high Km as compared to the active site. So this should make sense that we don't want a very high affinity in the allosteric site or it would be grabbing the ATPs quickly. So we want the concentration to be really high before it can make a biological significant inhibition. This is just showing you the different forms of the PK, PFK. Okay, the next step is going to be a cleavage step. Uh, we have fructose 1,6 bisphosphate that will be cleaved into two, three carbon molecules. Fructose 1,6. Hey, hey. This is Brenda, the not so good witch, signing off for today. See you next time on Dr. Bond Science Theater.